โมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังกัมมังสังขังนัมมัสสะมิอ uh, blessings for the new year it's a good time of year to review our practice a practice of following the Buddha and his path the eightfold noble path practice of dana sila bhavana In the beginning of the year, this is a time just to set your goal for the new year to come. What do you hope to achieve? How do you want to practice? Do you want to make any changes or adjustments to your life and your your practice? Is this a sort of suitable time, a pause between the last year and the new year? Most people, or a lot of people at least, are on holiday. For a few days, it's a good opportunity to consider what you want from 2022, what you expect, what you hope to achieve, what you hope to do. I imagine everyone would like to improve in their practice, improve their life, maybe even improve the world. <laughs> so it's a good time to think: Well, how can I improve my life, my my world? And the world around me. What, what do I need to cultivate more of, or do more of? And that is one, one of the sort of regular reflections we bring up in our practice. Where, where am I going wrong? Do I need to bring myself back in line with what the Buddha taught? Have I been straying from the teachings? Going in. A, A direction that's actually creating more stress and suffering and problems and confusion. So I need to bring bring myself back. Or maybe we don't feel we've strayed; we're still on the path, but just not putting as much effort in as we could have because of uh, other commitments. So sometimes it's a time just to re-establish your, the balance, the right balance in your life between your practice of dhamma and then. Work, family, other more mundane commitments. <coughs> so it's a good opportunity arriving at the new year to do this, to see what more we can do. Why? Because we're still subject to stress and suffering. Sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes it's still there. As Jen Cha used to say, you know, every morning when you wake up, ask yourself, "Why am I here? <laughs> Why was I born?" And one answer is, I'm, "I was born to find the way out of suffering, to practice the way that leads out of suffering." And The older you get, the more honest you are in this respect. You have to admit that oh, you still have some suffering there in in life. When we're young, we often don't see it because of the you know the pleasures of youth. The body may be fit and healthy and growing. There's lots of things to learn about the world, new things, exciting new things, all kinds of stimulation. So we tend to, as as young people, we often don't yet understand suffering or its nature very much. But as you grow older and you live in the world, have a sense of responsibility, maybe getting jobs, earning money, maybe having a family, relationships as well. Then often you you have to be. Honest and say, well, it brings with it responsibility. Brings with it also some stress. 
if we're not looking after our mind and we're not completely aware, then responsibilities tend to bring stress with them. So this is a good time to think about that and where you may need to make adjustments in your life. As we know with the pandemic situation, it's always changing. The rules and regulations and advice we get is always changing. The situation is always changing. So that's one external factor that we may need to adjust to. And then our health, our own personal health and age is changing. Maybe our job situation is changing. Some people are between jobs. It's the polite, polite way of saying unemployed. <laughs> uh, and it may be hardship with that, of course. Uh, it can be quite depressing being out of work. Or have a job, but you want to change some aspect of it. Some people are changing from school to uni, or one year of school to another year of school, and so on. Uh, everyone is changing, and this is a time of year when change is often pronounced because of the the pause in in things. So you can use that to your advantage when you you come to a change like crossroads in your life or have to take stock of your life then that's a time you can really see how much more you can introduce the Dhamma to your life because really if you practice the Dhamma up until this point and you found it helpful it should be clear that if you continue practicing you'll benefit more and if you put more effort into your practice you'll benefit more if you really want to improve things for the new year, then that's the way to go. Develop the practice that the Buddha gave us, the path of training, generosity, virtue, meditation, and developing wisdom, understanding, which helps us to free our mind from suffering. That's the way to go. We need to do more of it. So, you know, we, traditionally we have New Year's resolutions, but we can also just make our own plan. And, you know, so particularly with things like meditation, it's something that you, if you really want to benef benefit from meditation, you have to commit to regular practice. So this might be the time to say, how can I do more? Maybe devoting more time to it. You know, maybe committing to meditate every day bar a day that is really difficult for whatever reason, travel or illness or something. But generally speaking, you might commit to meditate every day. And if you've previously been able to meditate for a certain period of time, you might think, can I devote more time to it? <coughs> but you have to think about that, don't you? It's not simply an idea, oh, I should meditate more. You have to sit down and look at your life and say, is there a way I can fit in more time to devote to some meditation? Uh, the same could be said for chanting, listening to Dhamma, uh, and also developing the practice of generosity and kindness in daily life. So one thing I often recommend is for people just to commit to doing at least one kind thing for other people or another person once a day, at least once a day as a standard practice. And it can be a very small act of kindness, it can be an invisible act of kindness that no one really sees or knows about, or it can be something that involves another person, it can be something that takes a lot of time and energy, or it can be just a very quick passing act but to do at least one act of kindness for other people every day. I think if you can stick to that for 365 days, already that's quite a commitment, and it will draw out many good qualities in you, patience, effort, um, sticking with your commitment, the sort of loyalty and the um, truthfulness in that respect. And then by bringing up a thought of kindness and looking for opportunities, looking how to put that into practice, will just draw your mind to that way of thinking more and more. And it 
becomes a, a repetitive kind of good karma. Then by the time you complete a year of that, even if it was only very small kinds of acts of kindness, but by the end of the year, looking back, there'll be something you can feel good about in that year. And you know because you've, you've witnessed your own actions. And it's not to create a, uh, an inflated self-image that you're a good person. It's simply because it, it's a very wholesome, nourishing way to develop your mind by helping others. Whether you do a, a lot or a little, it doesn't matter, as long as you're doing something. That's the important thing. So when we say, how can I improve in 2022? How can, can I improve the world? How can I improve my life? Well, we start with ourselves, don't we? We have to work outwards. And we start in small practical ways. Like today, um, we had at the monastery, we had some novice monks uh, who were on a temporary novice program. They, they left to go back to families, go back to work. And one of the instructions we give them, following in the tradition of Ajahn Chah, we say, if you've used a kuti, you know, the meditation hut you're given in the forest, can you clean up before you leave that kuti? Because it was a place you made use of for a few weeks. There may be some dust, some rubbish, some bedding to remove whatever items you took there to remove them, bring them back to the main buildings and put them in the proper place. Ajahn Chah used to teach the monks like this. You know, he said, if you move into a kuti, like monasteries, forest monasteries have kutis, these little huts dotted around the forest. They're owned by the sangha, so they're not individually owned. They belong to the monastery, to the sangha. And we, so we like, we borrow them or we're given them as a place to practice for a while. Even if you end up staying in one for many years, it still belongs to the Sangha. It's not your individual property. So Ajahn Chah used to say, because of that, it's a, it's a building that someone else will make use of one day as well. You have to go in with the attitude, when I leave this building, can I leave it better than I found it? cleaner than when I found it. Maybe there's some small maintenance job that needs done, something fixing, so can I fix it up so it's better than when I found it for the next person to make use of it. It's just an attitude that you bring into your practice, particularly in monasteries, you're training like that. You use the toilets which belong to the Sangha. There's no individual owner, so it's not your toilet, say. When you go into a toilet, can I keep it clean or clean it up so it's cleaner than when I went in, ready for the next person? It's an attitude which often is, is missing in life now, isn't it? Because everyone is so busy and self-obsessed and so rushing here, rushing there. We often are not being very careful with how we treat what we call public property, the things of the world, whether it's the environment, public facilities and so on. It's quite unusual sometimes to see someone who takes care of things. Of course, people do, and luckily they do. All over the world, people do that. But still, it's an attitude that sometimes we forget. So it's one of the ways we train in the monastery is to, you know, you use something, you try and leave it for the next person as good as or better than before. So I, I've traveled with Lumpur Blian before on a plane and Paul Blian, you might remember, he visited uh, Melbourne many times, visited Singapore, Malaysia many times. He's a very great monk. And people often remember him for his Dharma talks and his meditation powers and his jhana and his psychic powers, which are all very impressive. But what they forget is he was a forest monk. He was a very humble forest monk who was well trained in all these very ordinary things that forest monks do. And so if you traveled with him on a plane, when he needed to go to the toilet, he'd go to the, you know, the public toilet on the plane, which are often you know, a bit dirty because many people have used them maybe in a short space of time. So he said his practice in the toilet on a plane, which is a public toilet, it was to always clean it up. 
So when he left it, it was cleaned as spotless as he could do in just the way, say, the, uh, the staff on the plane would do the same thing. You sometimes see them cleaning the toilets. He would do it. He wouldn't wait. He wouldn't complain if it was messy. He'd just do his best, clean it up. That's a really good example of how you can improve the world, make the world a bit better this year. Um, not just cleaning toilets, but that's, that would be something, isn't it? You know, keeping toilets clean, not only in your house, but wherever you work or places you go. But it's the attitude, isn't it? How can I leave this world a better place after me? Whether you're talking about a lifetime, you're born into this world, when you die, you're going to leave it a better place for, for what you've done. Or just one year, say 2022, can I leave the end of 2022 better than I started it? Whether you're talking about personal, personal practice or the, you know, the world around you, your immediate world, can I leave it better than before at the end of this coming year? Whether it's a place you stay in, you know, could be a hotel room, you go into a hotel room, you know, often we just leave it because there's maids and cleaning staff and you think, oh, that's their job, I'm not going to do it. But you can even think of doing that, cleaning up for someone, even if there's someone to do it and you know there is, you could still do it because it's for you as well, teaching yourself to look after the world around you and you do it as an act of kindness for whoever the person who's supposed to clean up, you just do it for them. And they come in and they say, oh, this guest was so clean. <laughs> They're happy. <laughs> and we often are not thinking like that, are we? Because our lives have become so complicated and rushed. We miss opportunities to perform acts of kindness. Well, like another one, is like I remember taking um, Lumpur Liam when he came to visit us and we took him down the Great Ocean Road. It's a very famous tourist area in Victoria, beautiful cliffs and oceans. And we, um, there was one day we had to take him to a restaurant to eat the, the meal. There was nowhere to go bindabata. He would have been quite happy to take his bowl and go bindabata. He did do that in some parts of Australia, but that day there was nowhere. So we took him to a restaurant and we had a meal on plates, glasses, plates, and the, the meal was fine and the people were very polite and friendly. But at the end, he just started cleaning up everything in the way he would. He's somebody who was like that. He'd clean up his plate, clean up the table, put all the plates in a pile, make sure the rubbish gets in the bin. He would do all that quite naturally because that's who he was somebody who just looked after or took responsibility for his own personal environment. Even though, of course, there were waiters, waitresses ready to take the things away, he was doing it all for them, which I thought, I think, brought a smile to their face. And that's good, isn't it? Bring a smile to someone's face. So how can you improve the world, make it a better place for you having been in it? Because we don't own this world, do we? We borrow it. We, we are just travellers who come into the world. We're born into the world. We're here for a while and then we leave it. And so if you think in this way, then rather than thinking, oh, well, I'll be gone soon, so I'll just take what I want and, and I don't care about what I leave behind. You know, that's one way of thinking about it. The other way is turn it on its head and say, how can I improve it? make it a better place for having me, me having been in it. Whether it's your hut in the forest or a toilet or a restaurant table or your place of work, what can you offer to the world that you're involved with, you personally? And you know, How can you do an act of kindness every day in one way or another? This way of thinking builds momentum so it becomes just part of who you are, becomes your karmic conditioning, you might say, and it's an antidote to many mental defilements, greed, anger, delusion, selfish, jealousy, stubbornness, laziness. You know, there's many what we call the mental defilements, the kilesis, which sneak into our behaviour every day. And as you're practising, your, one of the ways of practice is to counter them. 
And this isn't to make us like, you know, always judgmental of ourselves, finding fault with ourselves because we have chalases or other people with chalases, but just finding skillful ways to counter the chalases for our benefit and for the benefit of others. So it says an attitude as much as anything, you know, bringing this attitude up every day, how to improve things, how to make the world a better place. And also it's a practical approach, isn't it? You, you, you may not be able to solve all the problems of the world because they're too big and beyond you as an individual, but you can improve your immediate, the, the vicinity around you, the world around you, improve things in, in small ways and sometimes bigger ways as well, it just depends on your situation. It's something you learn, and this is something you learn from teachers like Lumpur Plian or Ajahn Chah. As a, as a monastic, you live in a monastery, you learn to look after your bowl, your robes, your dwelling place. You look after the buildings, even the public buildings, the facilities. <coughs> you participate in um, you know, the kind of activities of looking after the monastery. Uh, Ajahn Liam, another comment of his, Lumpur Liam, you, people would ask him, they'd say, who's the abbot of this monastery? You know, after Ajahn Chah died, Ajahn Liam became the abbot of Wat Bapong. But people didn't know him yet. He wasn't as well known as Ajahn Chah, so they didn't know what he looked like, who he was, so they'd come to the monastery. And they'd come up to him, you know, maybe someone had pointed out him out as the abbot, or maybe they were guessing. They come up to him and they say, who is the abbot of this monastery? And sometimes he'd ask, he'd answer, everyone is the abbot of the monastery. <laughs> and the word in Thai is Jiao Awat, which means like owner of the avasa, the, uh, the, the hermitage in the forest. We're all owners of it, meaning we all have a responsibility to look after it. If, you, if there is a role for an abbot, a senior monk, it's, you, know, you look after the place, you're sort of given that role to oversee things, but really everyone has that role. A sense of responsibility for the place that belongs to the Sangha. And just as in a family, you know, wherever you live, you may live with other residents, whether it's family or co-workers or just co-rental people in a rental pop property, you, 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 everyone has their role, don't they? Everyone has their responsibility towards the place you live. Even if you're renting it, you still have a certain responsibility to it. So his answer was just reminding people that they're also part of it. You know, and they say, where's the abbot? You know, of course, what they want to find is the teacher so they can get a, a blessing or a teaching. But he was giving it giving a teaching in that moment, pointing it back to them, saying, well, you're part of it as well. You're part, part, in part ownership of the monastery as well, it means responsibility. <laughs> People often don't think like this, do they? They come to a monastery and they, they only think the monks live there or the, the teacher is his place or her place. But actually you come, already you're part of it. You're already practicing part of it and the same way with the world we come into this world we're living on the surface of the globe each of us has some responsibility for the surface of this globe the world we live in the environment the trees the mountains the rivers the lakes the, the land we all have a small role to play in that You might say this is just waking up to the way things are, recognizing that, this, that we, we take a role, we have a role to play. So if you start from a place of kindness towards yourself, towards others, then you're meeting that responsibility with, from a good starting point. You know, kindness implies taking care of, wishing well. So as you're involved with people, or the land, or buildings, or mountains, or weather, or whatever it is, the ocean. You know, there's that sense of taking care of, we all have our, our bit to play, our role to play. And probably this is going to be even more important in the future. So, you know, 
for a new year, time of new year, thinking of the year ahead and many years ahead, human beings are going to have to take more responsibility or at least take responsibility for themselves living in, in the world because everything we do is going to affect everyone else. What we consume, you know, the resources, the food, the mineral resources, etc. We have to take responsibility for how much we use and what we do and how we relate to the world, how we relate to other people. And what the Buddha taught has, you know, there's many teachings and guidelines here to help us. You know, the Buddha encouraged us to think about the imprint we leave on this world in our, through our life. How are we going to treat other people, treat the environment, treat the things of this world? What imprint will we leave? When we leave the world, what will be left behind? Because this is really a reflection on karma, you know, recognizing that what we do matters because it comes back to us and to other people and to our children, future generations. But bringing it back to the present moment, you know, what we're doing from moment to moment through our day matters because we're constantly setting up the causes and conditions for the next moment, the next day. And particularly our happiness and unhappiness. You know, at this time of year we wish each other a happy new year. And the wish is a good starting point, it's a basic kindness between people, respect, kindness, generosity of heart. But true happiness takes more than just a nice wish. <laughs> we have to create the causes as well. And that comes back to how we're living, what we're doing, what we're thinking, what we're saying, what we're doing. So the, many people like to quote the Dhammapada, you know, these, these short verses which are so powerful and so profound from the uh, Kudaka Nikaya in the Buddhist suttas. And the Dhammapada verses are all about life, basically, you know, what is good and evil, what is the path beyond suffering, what is virtue, all the good, all good, good lessons. But how did, what is the first verse of the Dhammapada? It's all about the mind is the forerunner of everything. This is why Buddhism always flows back to your individual mind and how you're using and developing your mind. So particularly why we meditate, why we reflect on things, is because you're training your mind. So the Buddha said, you know, the mind is the forerunner of everything. The mind is the leader. It all originates from your mind. That's where karma begins, with an intention. An intention that becomes a mental state, you know, a thought or a mood becomes speech, becomes action. And our karma follows that, <clears throat> depending on the quality of the intention. So if the intention is wholesome, rooted in non-greed, non-anger, non-delusion, it will bring a good result. And this is something you have to really learn and witness for yourself. So as you practice m mindfulness, Self-awareness, meditation, you start to notice the quality of your mind. If you start holding on to negative thoughts, you start to feel stressed. If you indulge them, you cre create them, you indulge them, you construct them, you build them up, then you're suffering. That's something you have to really look at, observe for yourself. And once you observe and see you're creating suffering by holding on to negative states of mind, then the next step is to start abandoning them, letting them go. So this is taking responsibility for the world, but starting with your mind, the very origin of all our happiness or suffering. And just as uh, the negative states, the negative emotions, the mental calaces are to be abandoned, positive qualities of mind are to be brought up and cultivated. And that's where it takes a bit of effort, isn't it, to bring, bring up the kindness, the mindfulness, the renunciation, the letting go, bring up the wisdom, reflecting on things. It takes a certain effort. 
And if we don't keep putting effort in, well, the mind tends to drop back and gets out of, out of shape, just like the body gets out of shape when you don't exercise, the mind gets out of shape. Because the mind is the forerunner of everything. You know, it's something we have to look after. So Ajahn Chah said, you know, quite a direct teaching. He said, if somebody who doesn't look after their mind, their mind becomes like an orphan. You know, everyone feels sorry for an orphan, a, a child who's lost their parents. You know, it's not something you'd wish on anyone. But actually our mind is like an orphan in the sense if we're not looking after it taking care of it, learning what are wholesome dhammas and what are unwholesome dhammas and acting accordingly. If we don't do that, then our mind becomes like an orphan. No one's looking after it, it's neglected. And if you neglect things, you, t you tend to experience more suffering, don't you? <coughs> if you have a garden and you don't tend to it, don't water it, don't weed it, don't look after it, well, it'll become overgrown, difficult to be in. It'll be a place you can't walk through if, it, if you really let it go. A building is the same, you neglect it, then maybe it comes overrun by pests or just dirty, unhygienic. Uh, really anything in life that we neglect goes downhill. So we have to put that effort in, and particularly the mind, because that's the forerunner of everything. Everything we do and experience begins from our mind. It leads on to the making of karma and that karma comes back to us, good and bad, depending on the qualities of the intentions behind our actions. So another practice partly you know, to improve this year, improve 2020, is a practice of ending hostility, grudges, bad feeling, anger, ill will, hatred towards others that we may have uh, neglected or neglected to see or overlooked, not been aware of in the past or been aware of but pushed to the back of our mind. It's another pr good practice to start the year with is you know, let go of the, the grudges, the ill will because you've perhaps hold, held on to it for a long time now, weighing your mind down. Uh, holding on to anger towards somebody perhaps or a group of people or just some aspect of your life, some aspect of yourself. On the highest level we say there is no self. But at the same time to really see no self you have to clear the mind of the five hindrances and then use that state of peace and clarity to look and see the causal nature of our experience. Things arise due to causes. If we're still angry and harboring grudges and anger, it's very hard to see that. It's very hard to experience non-self or, or the peaceful mind because anger tends to breed more anger. Anger is not overcome by developing more anger. Anger is overcome by abandoning anger, letting it go. So that's a good reflection at the beginning of the year is that well I'm going to forgive and let go of all the anger I built up over the last year I'm going to set that as my goal to forgive to let go and then work towards it and in some cases it'll be easy in some cases it's very hard because maybe you've been hurt by someone or you know, your mind is really sticky on a particular issue or person but that's where you have to work. That way it's where you have to set your goal for this year. You're going to work to abandon that particular ill will or hatred to heal your own mind. And it may help others as you do this. It may not change them at all. Apparently you can't really know because they have to know for themselves. But we have to look after our mind because it's under our care. Otherwise it becomes an orphan again. So how can we improve 2022? Well, let go of anger and grudges, taking responsibility for what we do, looking into how to practice more kindness to help others. All of this is setting your mind up to really see more deeply into the, the truths that the Buddha taught, and particularly to see uh, 
this quality of not self. Because if you think about it, where does anger come from? Well, it comes from delusion, leading the mind into craving, and particularly what we call vipavadanha. It's craving not to become, not to be, not to have, not to want. Which is what anger is, isn't it? I don't want this, I don't like this, I want to get rid of it because I don't like it. In the end, there is no person getting angry. It's, it's a causal process. But you need to bring up mindfulness and reflect on it. You need to bring the clarity first before you can see it and recognize it. While we're angry, it's difficult to do that. So the first thing is to calm yourself down. Practice the forgiveness, the letting go, the acceptance. Sometimes we have to practice avoidance as well, just avoid the cause of our anger enough so that we can come back and look at it from a place of peace, calm ourselves down. But as we become more calm and we can see the suffering of anger and we're willing to let go, then we have to also contemplate the causal process that leads to anger arising and start undermining that, removing that. It's really, one, a lack of mindfulness, lack of awareness, and then two, holding on to something which gets challenged by uh, um, our experience, whether it's to do with other people or just the environment, the situation we're in, gets challenged, our, our holding on gets challenged and then we suffer. So it could be holding on to your, uh, to physical things, you know, when you, you get angry when things get damaged, you identify with your car or your phone, when it gets damaged you get angry because you're holding on. If it's a person, the person you love gets hurt or harmed or something goes wrong with them, you get angry. Maybe it's an idea, you know, politics, religion, philosophy, ideas of what are right and good or wrong. You hold on to your idea, when something comes along and challenges it, you get angry. So where you hold on is where you're conditioning more anger and more suffering. So Ajahn Chah used to say, look at where you're holding on tightly. You'll probably find that's where, what, it, what is the conditioning causal condition for your anger. So this is a quite a deep reflection, isn't it? You're getting to the point where you can see not only anger itself as suffering, but also the very underlying cause. If you can remove the cause or understand what the cause is and then remove it, then anger starts to fade, doesn't it? You can accept something, even you know, unpleasant things, you can accept without getting angry. They're still unpleasant, you can't change that, but you don't get angry over them. So if it's to do with people, like for New Year we say practice forgiveness, letting go, and what you're really doing is letting go of your anger, forgiving them, letting go of your anger, so that you can move on with a mind free from anger. Maybe that person is still, unfortunately, doing things that are harmful to them, to others. Maybe they're not changing much. But you are, if you're practicing this and you understand this point, then you're practicing yourself, you're improving yourself, you're improving the world. It may lead to an improvement in that person as well. It certainly won't make things worse. If you're abandoning anger, it won't make things worse. And hopefully they, they benefit. At the very least, you develop compassion. Because once you remove anger, kindness and compassion comes up in its place, doesn't it? You see the suffering of that person. Even if they're behaving badly, wrongly, you see they're creating more suffering for themselves. So instead of getting angry with them, you now just feel sorry for them, wish for them to improve, to change as well. So improving the world, you know, it starts with us looking after our mind, understanding karma, developing awareness, starting to abandon the root causes of greed, anger, delusion and the suffering they bring, bringing up the wholesome 
dhammas, kindness, mindfulness, wisdom, and so on. Putting them into practice and bringing the mind to a point where you can actually see the cause and effect at work. And then you're taking out this sense of self. So you're seeing anger arise, but not saying or thinking or viewing it in the way of this is me, this is a person, this is a being. But there is anger, of course there's anger there. Or there's greed, or there's jealousy, or there's worry and fear, you know, any mental defilement. It arises from a cause, it's there, and then the cause passes, and it's gone. But it's not really a person in itself, it's not a self. It is one, uh, it's a mental state that is, is a cause for suffering, but it's not a person or a being, me, you. The more we understand this, the more the mind lets go. And the sense of self is reduced and we're more at peace with the world, even when unpleasant things happen. When good things happen, we don't attach too much to them, don't get too overexcited. When unpleasant things happen, we don't get angry. And that's the goal, isn't it? Equanimity, keeping your mind in the middle, seeing things arise and pass away as causes and conditions rather than always taking it as me, mine, myself, us, them, me, you. <laughs> So there's many levels we can improve ourselves and our lives in 2022. I hope that I've given a few um, ideas to you in your practice and I wish you all a happy, successful 2022. May you find peace, may you find wisdom, may you be free from suffering, free from illness, free from obstacles, and may you uh, attain enlightenment.